thing that you're afraid to say is very likely the thing that the world needs to hear. Even if it's only one other person that needs to hear that message, if I can influence your life for the better, isn't that what life is about, is improving other people's lives. Welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. Reveal and define your voice to speak your truth through the power of podcasting. And I'm your host, Mary Chan. So, 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 let's go. Welcome to episode number 26. Today I have special guest, Tyler Foley. He is a fellow Canadian and here to talk a lot about stories. And stories are so, so crucial in the podcasting space. You can really be more engaging with your audience when you have a story to share. We all know and love stories, and that is how we connect on a podcast. So I'm so happy to bring on Tyler Foley. He shares his perspective through his acting and film and TV world. He's been in that world since he was six years old and is an accomplished film and stage performer as well. He has appeared in productions including Freddy vs. Jason, Door to Door, Carrie, and the musical Ragtime. And Tyler is passionate about helping others confidently take the stage and impact their audience with their stories. And that's why I've brought him on today. He also is the author of the number one best-selling book, The Power to Speak Naked. We're going to talk a bit about that stage fright, so many things, including tips and tricks to help your audience get over that stage fright, getting over the fear, and learning the secrets to being a more engaging speaker. Another reason I wanted to talk to Sean was because he comes from that visual media world with film, TV, and stage, while I am from the radio world where there are no visuals involved. So I wanted to dig into his brain a little bit and see what the difference is for those two things and how that visual world can help in the podcasting space as well. You are going to love his stories. He really walks the walk and show you how stories can really connect you with your audience. So get ready to hear his stories because it is all about learning on how to speak with confidence and communicate effectively using your power with your story. I have a radio background and now with podcasting. And I know stories are so, so powerful because we create that theater in our minds. But you have a TV, film, and stage background. So paint a picture of how stories play a vital role for you in your life. It's not just my life. It's your life, my life, your audience's life. We communicate through stories. We use allegory to explain our point of view. You know, it's an old sales adage that stats tell, but stories sell. And it's true, but there's more to it than that, right? Stories have the power to connect us, to communicate information, and it allows us to transport ourselves outside of our concept of the world into somebody else's concept of the world and give us a glimpse into how they see and perceive the events around them. And that's when true understanding comes. So I think uh, storytelling has been a powerful medium for us for eons and is only getting more prevalent as society ages. Yeah, it's like caveman times. They painted actual pictures on the walls and now us speech and using our words. Yeah, and these mediums are just, I mean, honestly, radio, podcast, TV, film, stage, they are all just fancy cave drawings. <laughs> They're just an evolved form of the medium. We're more sophisticated and, now, I guess. <laughs> uh, we'd like to think so. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so then what do you do differently performing on stage or on TV and film versus like what we're doing now with podcasting audio only. And when I was in radio, there's no visuals. So how does performing for an audience differ from these mediums, if at all for you? Well, it's a great question. So there are subtle differences and then there are also very large similarities. So let's address the differences. As you had mentioned in this format, it's completely audio. The only way that I have to portray emotion 
to portray feelings, to portray ideas, and to get that across to your audience is through my voice. So I have to be very conscious of what I'm doing and how I'm delivering that from the tone that I'm taking, the pace that I'm setting, the enunciation, the words that I'm using. But that's important even if I go into some of these other mediums. It's just with this particular medium, it's the only thing that I have. The only thing that I can play to is your auditory senses. Now, when I translate that into a visual medium, now I get to use more. So we can still have audio, but now I'm able to do visual. And in some instances, you can even do touch, right? Where if you, know, you do a sensory play, like I've been when they stage Rocky Horror Picture Show, right? Uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the audience is going to get squirted yeah, with yes. water. Or <laughs> same when they, they uh, stage The Walking Dead. Any one of those things and you're in the splash zone. Yeah. Or like those people who go to see, you know, um, like SeaWorld and the, the animal exhibitions, you have a visual medium, but then you also have a sensory medium with the performance as well. So you have the ability to draw on more senses with that, but the basic concept of performance doesn't change. So even if I'm on stage, I'm still going to use my voice in different ways. If I want to portray something, I'm going, I can, I can draw your interest in on stage the same way that I would on radio by taking time with my tone and bringing my voice higher or lower, changing pace and setting resonance. All of these things allow me to change up my speech pattern and draw you in. The visual medium is just helpful in that now I can gesture. And the funny thing is, is even when I'm doing recording, so I've been doing ADR and voiceover work and radio spots for years. As you and I had discussed prior to the show beginning, for me, I I have a very large theatrical bit to my performance. Your audience can't see, but you can, that I am incredibly animated. I'm still going to use... I'm a hand talker. I'm a full body yeah. gesture. The way that I've set up my studio, it's the same way that I would if I'm doing any voiceover work. So if I go in and voice over a cartoon, I give a full performance. I just have to remember that the microphone is now my camera. And when I remember that a microphone is a camera that I'm playing to this device, this medium, I just perform around it. So now my space holds me and I'm just performing to that capture device, which in this case is capturing my sound versus my visual performance. And then even stage to TV and stage to film has differences too, because in a stage medium, my audience is so far back that I have to wildly exaggerate my gestures. I have to take on this massive persona and then you change your voice inflection too. So if I'm performing in a theater, I'm going to project a lot more. I'm going to use my diaphragm. I'm going to try and and hit the back of the room where if I'm now performing voiceover work in an ADR studio, I can't, I'm not, I can't yell at the microphone. I'm going to the peak the levels, right? Yeah. It's going to go sound all crackly. Yeah. So we need to either have the right mic for me or have a sound tech who can adjust, or secret option C, let's make it easy on everybody else, and then I just need to adjust my volume on my own. And so I need to control my performance. I need to understand what it's for. Same with when I'm doing uh, film or TV. Now it's a more natural performance. It's a more natural tone, as opposed to a theatrical one where I'm really trying to push to the back of the theater. And even when I play music, it's the same way. Like I've, I've been a drummer in a band for years and years and years and years. And, you know, vocal performance, because I do backup vocals. So I'm drumming and I'm doing backup vocals. And that is a totally other separate thing altogether. Wow. That's a lot right there. I don't know if anybody was taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just getting started. Just getting started. <laughs> and with your TV experience, like you, you have on your bio, you've been on TV since you were six. How did that journey cultivate your voice and your confidence to speak? It actually started because when I was six years old, my father passed away. And I didn't really outwardly or openly grieve his passing for almost six years. 
And my mom and my uncle were kind of looking for an outlet for me. They, they, they didn't want me to be bottled up or pent up. And the reality was I, I wasn't. At six years old, it's, it's a really hard thing to process the finality of death. And, and, and it took me a bit to really understand it and get into a grieving process. But when you're an adult and you have a child who seems very disconnected, I could see where their concern was. If, As a parent now, if my five-year-old was behaving the way that I am told I was behaving at six, I would be concerned. And so they wanted to have an emotional outlet, an emotional release for me. And I'm lucky that I grew up with a fairly open-minded and artistic support group around me. And my uncle and my mom were able to get me into theater at a young age. And that helped me find both my technical voice. So how do I sound? How do I uh, use this instrument to the best of my ability? But it also helped me find my voice in the world, who I am as a human being, and find what was important to me, what my value system was, what I have held near and dear to me. So being in the arts was fantastic because not only did it train me technically how to use my voice, but then gave me the freedom and the ability and the understanding to not only use it technically, but to then articulate the thoughts that I had in an effective manner. So how do you articulate those thoughts? I have clients who sometimes they'll come to me and they're like, oh, I have all these things in my head and I want to say them all, but then they get mumble jumbled or I I just don't know what to say anymore. The first thing that you need to do is really find out what is important to you. Like what message do you want to communicate to begin with? And one of the things that I say to my clients when I'm coaching them is that authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness. So if you aren't self-aware, you can't come across authentic and, and the messaging is going to become blurred. So you need to know at your core who you are, why you're doing those things, why your story matters to you so that you can translate it so that it matters to other people. Totally. I tell my people the same thing too. It is all about once you know what your passions and emotions are, then your emotions will come out through the microphone and reach your listeners' ears. So I love what you're saying there. Well, and you touched on it too with the emotion. So you need to know what the emotional tie is. And, and the other thing is you need to know what you want your audience to feel. There's that famous quote that comedy is tragedy plus. So it's usually plus time or plus whatever. I can tell the same story multiple different ways and make you feel happiness, anger, sadness, whatever I want you just based on the context and the framing of the story that I tell you. Knowing what the end result, what the journey you want to take your audience on is usually critical to being able to convey that message. So what is the emotion that you want them to feel? What is the emotion that it makes you feel? How are those related or disconnected? How do you overcome that? All of these are, are technical bits of, of just basic storytelling that goes back to the Odyssey and Homer. What I'm also hearing too sometimes from people is that they have that fear of public speaking, even though they may say to themselves, oh, no, I'm OK. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a podcast. I need to talk all the time. But there's still, you know, that that little gremlin on their shoulder that holds them back a little bit. So can you explain how you dedicated yourself to helping people overcome this fear of public speaking? Yes, by uh, completely and totally abolishing the myth of public speaking. So when people say that they're afraid of public speaking, the nice thing is it's a lie that you tell yourself every day. You're not afraid of public speaking. Anybody, I, I will correct that. There is a very, 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 very small percentage of the population who legitimately are probably afraid of public speaking. But the 77% that in studies state that they have a fear of public speaking are actually lying. And to prove this, I would ask your entire audience to think of the last time they were in a restaurant and ordered food, because what they just did was spoke in public. And if you were able to ask for steak tartare and a side of mashed potatoes... I don't think I'll ever ask for steak tartare. <laughs> it, whatever your order is, you know, if I'm, if I'm taking my daughter and I have her order pancakes and she wants the extra whipped cream and strawberries, she just spoke in public. 
And it's actually one of the things that I've been doing very, very early. And as soon as my daughter could speak, she's five years old now, but from about one and a half on when we would go to restaurants, she ordered her food. We would ask her what she wanted. And the nice thing is, is, you know, most of the kids' menus are pictures, but she would order the food. So when we are saying that we're afraid of public speaking, it's, it's just a story. It's not true. We're not afraid of public speaking. We speak in public on a very, very regular basis and to complete strangers very often. So that's the other pushback that I get. Oh, yeah, no, I speak in public, but I'm actually afraid of speaking to strangers. I'm like, did you know your waiter before you ordered your pancakes? Because otherwise, that was a stranger to you. You didn't know them. Have so you true. ever gone to a hotel and checked in? How often are you at that hotel if you were buddy-buddy with the, with the clerk? You know what I mean? Like, we have stranger interactions all the time. So to answer your question, how do you get over that? It's to recognize that we're not afraid of public speaking. We're actually afraid of public judgment. Because when I order my pancakes, I'm not worried that the waiter is going to go, huh, like you need the triple stack. And he probably is. That's the fun <laughs> yes. thing. There is yeah. judgment there. there. There's very likely, I've been a server, we're judging you for the food that you're ordering, but we're not worried about it. What happens is when we get a public forum and we have to expose ourselves or we have to even say, you know, give a presentation that we're not entirely comfortable giving. Maybe we don't know the numbers very well or we're not sure why we were chosen or we feel that we were picked on by being chosen. That's when the fear of judgment comes in. And that's when we claim to be afraid of public speaking. What about the times when, you know, how you're in like in a group setting and the instructor or the teacher is like, yeah, I'm going to get each of you to tell me about yourself or whatever. And the person's always like, oh, don't pick me, don't pick me, don't pick me, please don't pick me. How do you get over that? It's the same thing. It's that fear of public judgment. What, what if I say this or they don't understand me or I, I you know, sit, make a fool of myself? That's usually the big one, right? Mm, yeah. what, if I, what, if I, what if I make a fool of myself? And the counter to that is, what if you do? Like everybody remembers the class clown. So sometimes I would, I would embrace that, like if, if you're worried about it. But the best way to get over that is the same way that you get over anything, right? If I wanted six pack abs, I can't sit on the couch and watch exercise videos. I got to get up and actually do a sit up. So if you are one of those people who are like, I just don't, well, I don't want to do this, start looking for the opportunities to do it. Because everybody knows, everybody knows that in those networking scenarios or in business things, tell us a little bit about yourself, give us your introduction. Instead of being the person who is terrified and waiting last, do what Brian Tracy says and eat the frog. Go first, because then you get it out of the way. You just swallow right now, get it done, and then you can enjoy listening to everybody else who does worse than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> because that's right. you set the you become the template by going forward. And so whatever you do, everybody else is just going to repeat. So you get to be the leader. And uh, trust me, it's a, it's more terrifying if you wait to the end. Because you hear what everybody else is saying, and now you're thinking, well, how do I beat that, or what do I do, or whatever. You go first, and you it's as scary as it is, it's, it's actually less scary than going last. I hate being the person to have to follow, right? I don't want to be the closing act. I want to be the opening act. I want to be able to go up, do my thing, get gone, and sit at the back and enjoy my time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder too, I'm like, should I really, I shouldn't go first because I'm, I am going to set the bar and, you know, I don't mind the networking stuff and I, I just like to talk. And so usually I get the comment of, uh, oh no, how do I follow that now? <laughs> yeah. Best, best compliment you can get, right? Because that means you hit it out of the park and you just leave it there. But you don't get that opportunity to do that if you don't go first. So for the people who are terrified, go first. Trust me, easiest way to go. Yes, I love that. I agree with you 100% on that one. But, you know, everyone's voice journey comes with some stumbles. And I'm sure you have too, because we are all learning as we go. So tell me a time when you failed with your voice and how you overcame that hurdle. Oh, the clearest one that I can think of, Mary, was when I was 14 years old. So at that point, I would have been in the performing arts for eight years, going on nine because I'd become so comfortable with performance, people just kind of look to me like if we're going to do a presentation in a school auditorium, right? Like you have an assembly and we need a, a poem read, we're going to get Tyler to do it because you just know because they got to get a kid to do it. So you might as well get a kid who's going to do it well and who wants to do it for at I must have been doing it for four or five years at that point at our Remembrance Day or Memorial Day ceremony. I would recite 
the poem in Flanders Fields. Very famous poem written by a Canadian during World War I. It's a, a staple and a mainstay in all of our ceremonies. You can't go to a Remembrance Day ceremony without it being read. But in this particular instance, again, I've been doing it for f- probably four or five years, had it committed to memory. It was just kind of one of those things. It, and it was rote dictation too at that point too. Like I would, I would say it and it was well, but it, there wasn't a lot behind the words. I was reading a poem. And, I, and, and I've been doing it so long too that I didn't really take it seriously. I didn't really study for it. I didn't rehearse or do any prep work. I just got up and gave the poem. But when I was 14, at grade nine assembly, I remember them, as they were getting everybody settled down, they brought in at the very end, they kind of were honoring some of the veterans that actually had been in the world wars. And I was in a very small town, so there wasn't a lot of them. There was maybe four or five gentlemen that were sitting at the front. But they brought in this one guy at the very end in a wheelchair. And he was decorated, like he was in his full military outfit. Do you know what I mean? Like the awards on the breastplate, he had his cap, everything was pressed. Like this guy looked like he literally just stepped off of a boat after D-Day. He was grizzled, just hardened. He looked like if you had kicked Clint Eastwood in the shins and then stuffed a lemon down his oh throat. Gosh. Like that's how he looked. Like he just wanted, he just mean. And these piercing blue eyes, I'll never forget them for the rest of my life. Uh, he looked like a white walker from Game of Thrones. Like just, Whoa. Uh, he was a very intimidating looking man. And I remember as they brought him up, thinking to myself, this man has seen the war. He has seen things. This is a man who, who knows. And here I am doing this poem. I didn't bother rehearsing it. I'm, I, just, I don't even have any emotion behind it. And all of these thoughts started flooding my head. And it's the first time that I allowed self-doubt and a projection of somebody else's judgment on me affect me. And I got stage fright everything that they talk about. I didn't know what stage fright was up until that point, because when you're six years old, you don't have any fear. And so there was no reason for me to fear an audience. I didn't fear people. In fact, I loved people. I remember the first time I got a standing ovation, knowing in my soul, it was the greatest thing you could ever receive. (laughs) And here I was at 14. And this was a new sensation. What is this? Why can't I? Why are my armpits this sweaty? Why am I so cold? Why am I shaking? Why is my throat so dry? How can my mouth be so dry and yet so much spit be coming out of my face right now? And all of these things went rushing through my head and I blanked. I didn't know what to say. And I literally lost my voice. And, and my the vice principal, uh, Dave Holloway Chuck, had to come <laughs> kind of kindly guide me away from the podium. Somebody got me a copy of the poem so that I could then come back afterwards and read it. Like, and I just felt, I just felt so ashamed and, and just awful. Like just, I I felt like I let that man down. I let the audience down, let my class down, I let my school down and all of this stuff. And again, it was just, it's imagined thoughts. What the reality was, I was like, I was 14 years old and I forgot a poem. In the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Right. That veteran dude probably didn't care. He probably couldn't even hear me. But it's what I thought. And and I really allowed it to control me. And so then I had to reverse engineer it and figure out how to make it so it didn't happen again. And how did that reverse engineering go? And did you do that when you were 14, when you reverse engineered it? No, no. But it wasn't very much longer after that. So the second time I had stage fright was at 17, giving a monologue as a final performance during my senior thesis year at my fine arts high school. And I I blanked out on that one, too. And it was the same thing. Lack of lack of preparation, lack of rehearsal and over emphasis on a false narrative of other people's beliefs of me. And as soon as I realized that I had the power to create the fear, I also had the power to control the fear, and therefore I had the power to eliminate the fear because all of those things were happening inside of my head. So at 17, that's when I really started to dive into it because I basically was like, I am never going to be afraid of an audience again. I, there's no reason to be afraid of it. I mean, it cost me you know, a, a passing grade at my fine arts high school. 
to not be able to to give the, a final performance. I mean, that's what you that's what you do. Basically, it was my last shot at making up for it because I had to withdraw from the musical that I was in in my senior year because in January I had a stroke that paralyzed the left side of my body, and I wasn't able to do the musical performance in the springtime. So this senior thesis project was basically my last shot to get all of my performance arts credits to be able to to graduate the show. So again, it was that built up pressure. I'd seen another student do the exact same monologue way better. Oh no. 10 minutes before I took the stage. So all of these things uh, accumulated to it. So that reverse engineering process happened basically uh, June of 1997, where I went, no, this can't be the way that it goes. I have to recognize that fear is coming from inside me. It's not external things that are happening. And the, that's the great news about stage fright and the fear of public speaking. And really what it is, is fear of judgment, is that it's not external forces that are making it happen. It's internal forces. And as soon as we can recognize that, it's so easy to eliminate because you just you stop the internal dialogue and change it. Yeah, it's beautiful. It, it truly is, comes all from just whatever's stirring in our heads. And people sometimes will say to me, but okay, now I know. So now what? What is that next step, though? It's using your power for good. (laughs) We're all superheroes. It is. It's superhero stuff. No, listen, we have the power to change our environment internally and externally. If we change the narrative that we tell ourselves, we can change our own physiology. We can change our own patterns, our own behaviors. We can control basically anything inside of ourselves by changing the narrative of the thoughts that we're having. But then if you can use that to overcome this fear of judgment and this fear of rejection and all of the things that stop people from really sharing a message or a story with the broader world, now you have the power to teach and to influence and to provide guidance to the people who really need it. One of the things that I teach in all of my workshops is the thing that you're afraid to say is very likely the thing that the world needs to hear. Even if it's only one other person that needs to hear that message, if I can influence your life for the better, isn't that what life is about, is improving other people's lives? Yeah, that is so much aligned with what I teach in podcasting as well. When people want to start a podcast, they're like, oh, but, you know, probably I'll just get like 100 downloads. Eh." But then I say, imagine if you were speaking in a room to 100 people. That's what your podcast is doing. It doesn't matter that you have 100 downloads. It doesn't matter if you have 10 downloads. You are impacting those 10 people with your message. And then amplify that because you never do just one show. Oh, yeah, exactly. Even if you give up after three or four, you've done three or four. And even if each one of those only had 10 downloads, even if it was the same 10 people that downloaded it, that's 10 people who needed to hear that message at that time. It's it's an amazing universal property where we get the messages that we need at the time that we need them. I would rather speak to an audience of 10 people who were fully engaged with my message than speak to an audience of 10,000 where only 10 people are engaged in my message. Yes. Yes, exactly. One, I have 100% engagement. The other, I have 0.1% engagement. And it requires about the same amount of effort, but the energy is different. Where if I've got 10 people who are fully engaged in me, I'm fully engaged back and, and there's a dynamics that's to it, there's an energy that's to it, and I'm fully on board. If I'm speaking to 10,000 people and I only got 10 eyes that are looking at me, giving me the head nod, I'm putting out all of this energy and it's not coming back, it becomes a drain and it becomes exhausting. Now, Flip side, you get all 10,000 people on your side. Oh, woo! Oh, that's a party. now that's a charge. That's a feeling that, that will never be duplicated. And especially when you can get hearts and minds aligned and alive in a same space, there is, a, there is actual science that shows there is a physiology and electromagnetic pulse that can go through a crowd. Like there's a, an actual oh, real really? feeling that can happen. Oh, yeah. If you ever get a chance, study heart math. It's an amazing, amazing science when the electromagnetic field that your heart puts out, when your mind and heart are in alignment, it actually grows. 
and you have the ability to influence other people because the great thing about uh, magnetism and electromagnetism is that uh, electromagnetic fields interact with each other. And if you can get everybody, heart and mind in alignment and you spread out the magnetic field and then everybody's magnetic field interacts it's like it's basically making a super magnet and there's a physical energy they can measure it they can measure it uh, notably on instruments there's a whole study behind it that's fascinating and i'm i don't know enough about it to be able to be an expert <laughs> but i've read enough about it to know that you gotta look into it and bring some experts on board heart math okay because i always feel like that energy is there, right? But having some words to it that you described, that's awesome. I'm going to look that up. Heart math. Well, and it, it is an amazing study. And for anybody who is thinking, ah, oh, Tyler, that's a little woo-woo. I don't know that I really want to want to buy into it. I'm like, hey, listen, if you don't think that what I'm saying is correct, when you go to an orchestra and you hear that swell of music and you get the hair that tingle on the back of your spine, that's a real thing. And why does that's a, a physiological response to an auditory input? And where your mind and heart align, and that's why you get that tingle. And if they really don't want to believe me, they're like, yeah, I would never go to an orchestra. I'll be like, okay, I'll challenge you one further. Have you ever walked into a room where two people have been fighting just immediately prior to you going in? When you go in, they're not fighting. But just before you entered that door, they were fighting. You can feel that energy. Oh, the tension in the air. Yes. Right? It's a palpable thing. You can physically feel that tension. It's the same thing. It's the electromagnetic pulse. And in, in, in that case, it's in dissonance. So it's not harmonically aligned. And that's why you feel that weirdness going in. Fingernails on a chalkboard kind of feeling. It's, it's because it's a real thing. They can measure it. Yeah. And I hear that too in people's voices on podcasts. Like if people are feeling anxious, that comes through in their voice as well. And so I love this talk that we have about voice and podcasting. And just before we started recording, you were telling me that you were on 86 podcasts as a guest this past month alone. Yep. So what is inspiring you right now about the podcasting space that you want to be a guest? Because what a phenomenal environment to be able to reach targeted audiences and spread your message. I think anybody, whether they have a show or they want to be a guest on a show, this is an incredible age of communication. It doesn't take, there's a lot of effort that goes into putting into a show on, like I'm not discounting it at all, but compared to what it would have been 20 years ago, to be able to broadcast yourself. Now we have YouTube, we have podcasts, we have all of these abilities for us to get messaging out. And in to that, to the amount of work that's going on, I want everybody who's listening to Mary's show right now, I just, I want you to hit pause because we have the ability to do that. You're listening to this. I want you to hit pause and I want you to go and I want you to give her a five-star rating and a review right now. If you're listening to this and this has impacted you in any way, I want you to say how that's impacted you because what Mary is doing is not easy. She makes it look easy. More specifically, sound. she makes it sound <laughs> easy. And the amount of effort that she goes into making a quality audio broadcast for you to be able to listen to this is incredible and awe-inspiring. I have been a guest, as she pointed out, 86. I will be on 86 shows this month. And the level of detail that she put into making sure that our message was clearly heard was second to none. So I want you to hit pause right now, give her a five-star review. We'll give you two seconds, then come back and we'll close up this show. But please, 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 it helps get them out. And this is just such a phenomenal device and tool to do it. So let's give props up to her and make sure you give her the five-star review, please. Tyler, thank you. <laughs> totally humbled by that. Thank you so much. So we're going to close up the show now. People are hitting play again on their phone, device, wherever Welcome they're listening. Back after that five-star review. Exactly. <laughs> if you can share one tip that will immediately impact a podcaster's voice, what would that be? It would be to know that your story matters. And you need to really believe that. A lot of times people say that you can fake it till you make it. And I do not believe that to be true. I believe you have to know in your heart that the thing is true before it can manifest itself. You need to know that you are the expert. And it's one of the reasons why using the power of story, tell your story. Don't try to tell somebody else's story. Don't try to tell your story the way you think somebody else wants to hear it. 
tell your story your way because nobody is the expert of your biography better than you. There are tips and tricks that you can use to be more compelling with that story. And we can, you can work with coaches. You can call up Mary. She can work on crafting it better. But I want you to make sure that you tell your story your way because there is power in it. And the worst thing you can do is not share because you never know who needs to hear your message. Thank you so much for listening to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you'd share it with a podcasting friend. And to reveal more voicing and podcasting tips, click on over to visiblevoicepodcast.com. Until next time.